Welcome everyone, this is Terry Roberts with Destinations International. We are the Trade Association for Convention and Visitors Bureaus, and we're so glad that you have joined us for our webinar today, Actionable Tips for a More Diverse and Inclusive Meeting. I'm really excited about this topic. I think that it is um, current, topical, really important and, ga and really gathering, garnering so much attention right now, not only in politics and in Hollywood, but certainly in corporate America. And with that in mind, I'd like to first introduce you to our panelists today, our planner panelist, Mazda Miles. And Mazda is the chief event strategist at her own award-winning Philadelphia-based company, perfection events. And Mazda, I know that you have close to 20 years of experience both designing and executing meetings and events. And you are also the president of the National Association of Women Business Owners there in the greater Philadelphia area. And you have a very respected voice in this conversation on diversity and inclusion, both regionally and nationally, and I just so appreciate you sharing that with us today. So welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So to get started, um, we know that it's timely that we turn maybe this review of diversity and inclusion towards our own meeting and events, but deep diversity really isn't about who's invited to attend the meeting or event. It's also about who is given the role of participation, content delivery, leadership. This is where I think true inclusion starts to thrive. So Mons is gonna take us through three primary areas of concern. First, we thought we would start with sort of looking at some common gaps, mistakes, and assumptions that event planners make. Secondly, if you want to apply a more diverse lens to all aspects of your meeting, um, Mazda's got some great tips and actionable considerations for you. And then we all know that to make anything come alive, that we have to give it specific objectives and apply some um, metrics for measurement. So Mazda will then turn our attention to that. So Mazda, let's jump right in uh, on this topic. First, as you talk about those assumptions and, um, you know, gaps, what goes wrong? What do you, in your experience, both personally and, and watching and attending and being part of other events, do you see that meeting planners and event planners don't turn their attention to? Sure. So one of the first things um, and one of the most important things that I talk about when it comes to us looking to really think about how we increase diversity and inclusion is to be collaborative. Um, and that sounds great at the surface, but, but really digging into that and getting feedback from other people regarding our ideas, um, asking them for their ideas on how we can make our meetings more diverse and inclusive. Um, and I say that because like you said, from personal experience, um, I have absolutely been to many events with all of the right intentions to make me feel included and then found that what was really meant to be thoughtful actually ended up to be offensive to me. And when I asked the question, who collaborated on this approach? You know, I inevitably found out that one person or a group of, you know, particularly non-diverse persons made all of the decisions. And so I really want to, um, you know, tell folks, you know, that when we go from what's in our mind and assume that it's the only or correct approach, we have the opportunity to miss so much. And so sometimes we do more harm than good with our assumptions. And though it's, you know, fine to be clear that you don't expect one person to be the voice of quote unquote, all their people, you know, just sure. bringing the right people to the table, letting them know that you value their feedback and you would love their thoughts on ways to expand the diversity and inclusion of your meeting um, really goes a, a long way. So I think that's one big, big thing, just being collaborative and getting all collaborative and getting all those voices at the table. Um, the second thing that I'll say um, is that sometimes we as planners just are not even aware of our own biases. 
Um, and we all have them. Every single person has them, regardless of who you are, if you are of a minority group. Um, I have laughed and chuckled within my own family about certain things that I won't be specific about because it's embarrassing. Some of our own biases that we don't even realize are there until we make an action or say something and say, oh my God, I can't believe I had that bias. And it's all about just being aware so that we can correct that action and really honestly be fair. Um, so one of the things I wanted to mention, though, is on the national stage, um, this kind of unconscious bias um, uh, conversation came to the national stage recently. I know, Terry, you and I kind of um, exchanged about this National Geographic um, article that came out where they acknowledged that their past coverage has been racist. And, you know, here's a publication that certainly didn't mean to do that, but they realized that they had been only showing America through one lens and people of color in America through one lens where people of color were only being shown primarily as laborers or as, uh, you know, domestic workers. Um, and they just recognized that, right? Someone somewhere recognized it. And now they're making steps to make the change. So I think that number one, being collaborative, and number two, recognizing our own biases so we can make changes and be more inclusive. Yeah, I thought that was such a cool article, Mazda. And I'll put a link in the follow-up um, email to everyone. But you know, that a publication like National Geographic would take the time, hire a consultant. They were mm -hmm. going to produce this article on race. That's their, you know, their complete um, intent of this one publication is to examine race. And they thought, well, before we go out and speak on this subject, maybe we have to look at our own biases as well. So really interesting. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. Absolutely. So let's then dive into, you've taken the time to maybe talk to folks, bring people to the table, look at some of your own biases, and now you really would like to turn a, a more complete lens to the plan. I'd like to start by just asking you, what are some of your recommendations for some real actionable steps for improvement? Okay, great. First of all, you know, I, I like to suggest that Planners think of diversity and inclusion, and everyone just thinks of diversity and inclusion holistically. Think about every single way that your attendees will interact with you and with each other, and think of ways to make all of those experiences inclusive from, ex from the planning and the inception all the way to the execution. And I say that because we are often really successful at one-offs. But when it comes to the entire experience, sometimes we kind of miss the boat because we're, we're in it and we're planning. Um, there obviously are very obvious things like making sure that our speakers and our panelists are diverse. Um, but there are other less obvious things like how you ask about gender in the online registration process. Every single time we touch an attendee, we want to think about how can we be inclusive? How can I make them feel comfortable? How can I make them feel like this is their space, like everyone else's space? They are equally welcomed and wanted here. So I just, every, every single time we touch them, we start touching them with marketing and we end touching them probably with some survey, right? And all in between that, we're, talk, we're doing so many things where we touch them. How does each of those experiences um, relate to, to how we include them? Um, and, and another thing is, also, just really setting up our systems and processes to ensure that equity. Um, you know, it's really great for us to say we're, we're going to do it, and it's awesome if we do it one time, um, but are, are we going to sustain it, right? So, great, we did it for this meeting, or great, that was really awesome, this program was amazing, everyone felt included, and then we go back to what's probably just our normal way of doing things without continuing to repeat that process. Um, things that are that put into process actually flow through to what we execute every day. So putting that into a process. Um, and finally, getting buy-in all the way through the organization, right? Because um, we are, I, I like to think of what I do as something that is bigger than just what I do. So especially, I mean, I own my own firm now, but I worked for a lot of other companies. And when I left, did I leave a legacy? So if I didn't get buy-in all the way through the organization, these ideas about diversity and inclusion and everything else that I brought potentially died with me. 
And so I think it's really important that we get that buy-in, not only so that it is executed um, the way that we want to and that you know everyone believes in it, but so that it remains and it's living even after you leave. Wow, that's powerful. Let me then turn to like some key, so some, some specific steps, Mazda, some key considerations. Um, and I know you have some strong opinions here about how people should drill down more specifically. Sure. So a few just tips and tricks for me um, are, number one, I, I always want to ask about, and I always do ask about the diversity and inclusion policies of the venues, right? Do you have an overarching policy? If I'm bringing my program here and my money here and my spend here, you know, it's important that I know that we believe the same things. Um, I'm always looking at the climate of the city or the locale. Like, are there other known, are there any known tensions or concerns regarding discrimination and intolerance in that locale? It doesn't mean that I won't put a meeting there, but I should be aware of it so that I can take the extra steps to make sure that my meeting reflects our values holistically. Um, I always ask about kind of the diversity and inclusion ratio of the staff and vendors. Um, and, and, and I also myself, also consider that. I have some clients that require that based on the, the kind of company they are and their values, but I myself am always looking at that ratio. Um, are the staff members and the vendors reflective of the diversity that I'm saying that we champion and that they say that they champion? Um, another one big one that actually was brought to me from, from um, experience, and it just made so much mm -hmm. sense, and I think one that gets lost in the shuffle sometimes um, is the, the accessibility efforts, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that there are ADA laws and we know what's required, but are there efforts outside of the generally accepted guidelines? Like meaning does the venue, um, does it or is it willing to go above and beyond the guidelines to make all attendees feel considered? And it's one thing to you know, obey the law, and it's another thing for everyone to feel considered. Um, I'll give one quick example of that, not so much for the venue, but for me as a planner. Um, we did an event, a very small event, and this was years ago, and someone responded to me, and I said, wow, um, we'd sent out an email to tell folks how they could access the venue. It was a special event. They had to take the elevator, let's say, to the 12th floor, and then once you got to the 12th floor, you would walk down the stairs to the actual where the actual special the party was the vip client party was and the venue absolutely had an accessible entrance and an elevator that would take them straight to that level so the venue was correct in that they had that but we as the planners were incorrect because we assumed that everyone could walk down those steps and we did not say in the email if you need uh, you know direct access to the venue you can simply ask the front desk for the you know, particular elevators that will take you to, you know what I mean? We, we right. excluded those people in our communication. And that just opened my eyes about how we, again, are holistic and, and thoughtful in what we do. Yeah, you really bring up a really good point about how each individual component um, needs to be examined. And, and I think that as we get into your recommendations for metrics and measurements that you have some good takeaways there. So let's talk about that then, Mazda. What, how do you, you know, we all know what gets measured gets done. And I think that you spoke to that earlier when you said, you know, you have to put things into processes so that, you know, even if you're no longer there, that these things continue to live. So what are some of your suggestions for beginning to set objectives and then being able to you know, to have some measurability. Sure. So, so as stated before, and really my rallying cry around being holistic, I think that we have to set our expected kind of inclusion metrics across all areas of diversity, kind of for this 360 degrees of the event planning process. So get really specific, um, not just, you know, do what we have one person of color and one potential LGBT, one woman, but being di really diverse to me really means shifting the mix from majority to equal footing. And in order for us to do that, we have to be intentional. So if we say something like at least 50% of the following mix of these categories should be filled with individuals representing a diverse or minority community, that's being specific. And
and then we sit down and say what are those what do those considerations include they include ethnicity religion gender sexual preference age disability impairment you know you'd be surprised how much diversity and inclusion can come out of just being intentional. Um, and then down, drilling down into the planning team, internal staff, vendors, ad hoc committees, the marketing materials, the speakers and the panelists, the hired vendors, the attendees and participants, how are we targeting them? The sponsor organizations, no one thinks about sponsor organizations, we just want their money, right? But are we thinking about that? We should, you know, and yeah. even down to our volunteers. So really, again, being very specific about and intentional about how we can create equal footing so that we have a, a, a mix that's not just a majority mix. You know, Mazda, you made me think about inclusion rider. <laughs> I'm sorry, should I just call you Frances McDormand from now on? <laughs> you know, when, oh my goodness, that moment during the Academy Awards when she, first of all, she was giving this rousing speech and then she just yeah. ends it with inclusion writer. I mean, I screamed in my living room when I was next to my girlfriend. We always watch the Oscars together. And I'm like, yes! Um, yeah, it, you know, it does bring measurability, right? It, it correct. Brings, and I, I know that, and that can take many forms. So what is the inclusion rider, if you will, for meeting an event is to get specific, right, against all these mm -hmm. individuals that are represented and then comparing that. I, I'd just like you to speak, if you wouldn't mind, just a little bit more about moving from majority to equal footing. It's, it's more than just a number, right? Because it can't just be a number. Right. Right. I think it's not just a number. I think it's really about, you know, representation. It's about look and feel. It's it's about culture. It's It's about everything. I think that there are so many places in an event um, where we or a meeting where where we are we are affecting people. One of the questions that I ask my clients when we begin to design an event is what do you want people to know, do and feel? as a result of this, right? And so it's not just about the information, the no, it's not just about the action steps to do, but what do you feel when you walk in the room? Do you feel like you're among, you know, what truly represents who we are and not just, like you said, a, a majority? So it's not, it, it, you know, what do you feel when you eat food that is only American? What do you feel when you eat food that is a, a, a great mix of other things? So I, I think there are so many areas to touch and it's not just the number of people, it's every single aspect of the event. Which is great. Very inspirational, Masa. I think I, I really appreciate you being so thoughtful and deliberate in this, you know, presentation. And I think you've given the planners that are here a lot to think about. I'm going to give them some time um, to put some questions on the board. I noticed that we already have one, so we'll continue. If you can type in your questions for Mazda now, I'd like to um, turn and introduce you to my coworker, Jim McCall. Jim McCall is Destinations International VP of Destination Development and Advocacy. And Jim, I know that you have some thoughts um, on how the Convention and Visitors Bureaus in the destinations. The Mazda talked about really being clear, you know, are the political tensions, are there something, is there something going on in the destination that isn't inclusive or isn't diverse or, um, you know, makes a certain group feel excluded. And I know that your work has a lot to do with how our destination organizations can help planners work through some of these issues in the community. So I know you've, uh, you've come up with three ways in which the CVB can intentionally help the planner with this research. So Jim, would you speak to those for us? Yeah, thanks, Terry. And thanks so much uh, to Mazda for providing all that useful yep. information. Um, I, I love the fact that she talked about checking and monitoring the political climate and the destination that she's hosting or meeting. Um, I think that's incredibly important and obviously you want um, the destination that you're going to to align with the, the values of your organization, the values of your event. Um, and I think one of the issues that, that comes to mind is that's not always the, the simplest task. Um, you know, if you look at 
advocacy, advocacy groups and, and legislation that takes place in, in destinations, it's usually an incredibly complicated and, and long process. It's, you know, a bill goes, it, it gets introduced on the floor, and it goes before committees, and then it um, goes to a vote, and then it still has to be signed by the executive. And even then, after it's enacted, it can sometimes be challenged in the courts. And it's it's really hard sometimes to get a sense of what's actually happening in their destination. And advocacy groups spend um, an enormous amount of time following these pieces of, le of legislation to get a clear picture of what's happening. Um, and we all know today that it's it's hard sometimes to find factual information that, to really get a clear picture of what's happening on the ground in a destination. And a CVB, a, de a destination organization, can really be a resource for you. Um, they're likely monitoring these pieces of legislation very thoroughly. They have a sense of what it actually means on the ground, um, can give you an idea of what it'll mean for your meeting or event, um, and can provide you sort of that on the ground, real time, um, independent um, picture of what any sort of legislation that you have concern with or issues that you have concern with um, really means and monitor that for you in a, in a uh, helpful way. The second thing would be um, to use them as a, a connector, a message provider to sort of local city, state, um, community leaders, legislative leaders, um, with any concerns that you may have. Um, destination organizations realize that it's in their uh, best interest to be uh, viewed as a, a welcoming, inclusive, diverse um, community that, that brings in people from all different backgrounds and helps provide, you know, we all see travel as something that connects people of different backgrounds. So that's what they're in the interest of promoting. And if some sort of legislation or issue arises in their community that is seen as discriminatory, they're they're likely trying to fight it and, and push back against it because they know it's not in their best interest. And one of the most effective ways they can do that is from hearing from folks like you who who would like to bring your meeting to a destination, but you have an issue with this, and they can bring those concerns before the political leader. They have those connections, and they can sort of be an avenue for you to have your voice heard within a community that you may not have um, connections in. And finally, I think most importantly is really helping you to engage in the local community and create a positive impact. Um, Mazda talked about you know finding vendors who are who have diverse policies and are inclusive, um, <clears throat> they may be able to connect you with, uh, you know, not, not just vendors, but, but businesses in the local area that, um, that resonate with your group. Um, you look at uh, situations like just this week, South by Southwest is taking place in Austin, Texas. Um, the state of Texas recently passed a bill called SB4, which would outlaw sanctuary cities. And a lot of folks saw that as a discriminatory piece of legislation. Um, and some people even called for a boycott of the state of Texas. They wanted South by Southwest to take their meeting out of Austin and move it somewhere else because of this piece of legislation. The CEO of South by Southwest said, no, we're not gonna do that. Austin is part of our event. It's part of our um, core values and we're gonna continue to go there. But what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna hold a session during our, our new city summit and talk about sanctuary cities and what they mean and how to make them more effective and make them a better um, atmosphere for everyone. And he brought in the chief, chief equity partner from the city of Austin to be on that panel and talk about it. Um, I think those types of options where you can actually go to a place that may um, be dealing with an issue themselves and, and go talk about that and actually have some sort of productive conversation where you get people with different backgrounds talking about issues in my mind, that's always so much more effective than trying to avoid a conversation. And a CDB can really connect you to the folks on the ground who allow you to have that conversation. Those are great takeaways, Jim. And, and actually, I'll, I'll turn to a question that Melinda um, had. And, and it was really one that you just kind of began to address is that, you know, what happens when um, you have a contract already and then something happens after the fact, you know, how can you, you know, how can you make positive action? So, Jim, what you just said about, you know, bringing it into your programming or maybe creating some kind of media event or doing a community service project or putting together a rally or a march. I mean, I think there are all ways in which you cannot avoid the destination and avoid the conversation that actually become part of active change. So um, thank you for putting in questions. Thank you, Jim, for that. Um, Kate, if you could kind of survey the questions now, I know there's a couple of others. Um, 
I will tell everyone that your CMP credit for this event will be coming in your email next week, and be sure to check your spam. I would like to invite you to join us uh, next month for our webinar, and the link will also be there. We'll be tackling a little more uh, common but important aspect of meeting planning, which is getting the most out of your site inspection. So, Mazda, let's um, turn back to you now. I know that there are some questions, and I want to make sure that we give an opportunity for you to answer those. So, Kate, are you ready um, on the question yes. board? Uh -huh. So, we have a question from Mustafa, and he is asking, can you talk a bit about how to get sponsors who are spending a lot of money to come to these events to bring a more diverse delegation without offending them? Hmm. I think that... Um Depending on what the event is, so if the event is does have some sort of inclusion focus to begin with, usually the sponsor gets that point and thinks about it already and, and sends the right delegation. Um, but I think there's, um, I don't think that you can tell them, you know, that they're doing it wrong or that they shouldn't. But I do think that we could, uh, you know, somehow in our, our messaging, uh, when, so for instance, when I'm asking sponsors um, for, say, for instance, a gala, that they purchase tickets and they are, at, you know, they're paying all this money, for this huge sponsorship, um, corporate gala, whatever, and they're spending all this money for this nonprofit, and then I know that they're sending like their lowest level employees, right? I and no one likes that, you know, because they're like, okay, you're just kind of giving these tickets away to anyone, and these are not really necessarily movers and shakers and people that actually can influence, you know, whatever the other people are trying to do in the room, and so I have talked to them or put in the messages that we find, you know, I have some kind of language around, it would be great if, you know, uh, you have 10 tickets. We, you know, certainly don't want to tell you what to do with your tickets, but it would be wonderful. We're really looking forward to having a mix of your senior leadership as well as your, you know, uh, because you'll have the opportunity to connect with other senior leaders, and I kind of tell them who's going to be in the room, and then I say as well as, you know, your up and coming, your high potentials, who will be able to connect and network, and I talk about kind of what the benefit is to each of those levels coming and I have actually seen a shift where they are more thoughtful suddenly about who gets those tickets and the shift of the people in the room has changed just because I communicated it so I think that we can be thoughtful in talking about you know how important the diversity or the inclusion is or the mission of the event in some sort of way that then without us pointing to them doing something wrong we are encouraging them to just be thoughtful and from there, you know, they will do what they do. But I think that at least communicating it will at least encourage the thoughtfulness. Interesting. Hey, Kate, can you go to Lucy's question? And then I'm going to see if I can unmute uh, Philistia Hatton for her comment. I'm not sure if she has her audio turned on, but I'm going to try. Okay, so uh, Lucy is asking if you can provide examples of thoughtful and thorough registration forms that gather the appropriate diversity components and any um, policies for vendor samples. Sure. Um, I don't know what the, the best way is to do that. If I can maybe provide some samples, if you guys do a link afterward. But um, we I, we have done some pretty intense um, like gender questions and ethnicity. We've worked with a, a lot of different organizations. So I literally have the gamut of that that I could provide um, after this, if you all are willing to distribute it, um, as well as some vendor language. So I know in the question and answer period, I probably don't have very much time, but if there's a way for me to give information, I'm glad to provide it. Yeah, that'd be great, Mazda. If you can give me, um, you know, after the webinar, we'll be sending out our, our follow-up communication next week. So if maybe by end of day tomorrow or early on Monday, you could get me the links that you would like us to include, I'll make sure they're included. Perfect. All right, let me see if Philosia can be unmuted. I don't know if you have your audio hooked up. Philosia, do you have a microphone hooked up? Um, I don't. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. We can hear you. Oh, I do. Well, good. <laughs> I'm, I just I've got thought a... you had a nice, a, a nice comment for Mazda, and I'd love for you to share. 
Well, I appreciate it. I'm in the library, so I'm going to talk a little softly. Um, but yes, I have. Um, I really appreciate this this seminar, and I, I signed up intentionally because I used to run a program called Leadership Greater Washington, which still exists. There are leadership programs across the United States in almost every city, and in those um, organizations, we are intentional about addressing the issues of diversity because the intention of the organization is to bring emerging and existing leaders of major corporations, public and private organizations and businesses together to address the needs of the community. It could be transportation, it could be homeless issues, it could be the arts, it could be um, criminal justice. And in all those areas, we're dealing with um, diversity because that's the way our world and our communities are built. So we dedicated two days, full days. Um, it's a 10 month program that two days that deal with um, uh, biases and racism and prejudices and people open up. It's a facilitated um, discussion and people are encouraged and they do open up about some of the situations that have occurred in their lives um, people who who came up through the 60s who were um, beaten down to the ground and arrested for no reason, um, to people being called that inward. I have been called that in my lifetime, but it, it helps us to understand that we are human beings and that in order for us to address the issues that confront our communities and our people and our society, we have to deal with all the stuff and baggage that we come with. So I I wanted to share that because I am very happy that you are dealing with this issue because it is what I think we might have just lost your audio, but I do appreciate that. Um, I would just like to shout out to Allie Best. I think she's on with us today and it was really her idea at Destinations International for us to tackle this topic. And Mazda, I think you just did a really marvelous job um, helping us at least begin a discussion on how planners can be more thoughtful in diversity and inclusion in their events. Absolutely. It was completely my pleasure. I'm so happy and I just give kudos to you all, like you said, for starting this conversation um, because it is necessary and that uh, we can get to the next step as long as we continue to take steps. That's great, everyone. I hope that you will look in your mailbox next week. You will get um, uh, the slide deck. You will get the recording. You'll get your CMP credit. Uh, we hope you'll share uh, the link to the recording with some of your peers or some of your staff that you think might be interested. And Mazda, if you want to send me uh, links to some samples for registration or vendors, I'll be happy to include those as well. Wonderful. we Will do. All right, thank you, Mazda, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Kate, for helping us out today. Everyone have a wonderful day.